when you hear the word spiritual warfare, what comes to mind? How would you define spiritual warfare? I would define spiritual warfare as a spiritual attack by the evil one. A spiritual attack by the evil one. What does that look like? It will look like a Job experience. You're living the righteous life. You're living for, Lord, for the Lord. And then out of nowhere, a spiritual attack comes upon you. That spiritual attack is so great, it discourages you. It tries to leave you hopeless. It tries to destroy you. It tries to take you out. A spiritual attack by the evil one is where the evil one uses someone else as a pawn to wreak havoc and oppression on your life. If you are a child of God, if Jesus Christ is your savior, how do we respond? We respond, guess what, by doing nothing, by going with the flow, by having our eyes open and our ears sharpened, listening to God for our very next move. We are watching God, seeing how God handles this situation. We are not involved. We don't take matters into our own hands. We trust God to handle that situation. And when God handles that situation, we have a Joseph experience with the enemy or the evil one meant for bad. God takes that situation and makes it good. He blesses us in the midst of that spiritual warfare. Welcome to the Sunday School Lesson with Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson. Hello everyone, this is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III bringing you the Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, April 19th. 2020. Our Sunday school lesson will come from Esther chapter 7 verses 1 through 10. The title of the lesson is An Executed Scoundrel. An Executed Scoundrel. Before we get into our lesson, if you find out this lesson is very helpful, I would appreciate you hit the like button and the share button. Or if you think that somebody else can benefit from them, Hit the like button and the share button and the subscribe button on YouTube. That will be very helpful in getting this message out, this important Bible study to as many people as possible. So thank you so much in advance. So let's get into our lesson, The Executed Scoundrel, Esther chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Uh, before we get to chapter 7, 1 through 10, our key passages uh, we need to know what's going on in Esther. We just can't go to chapter 7 and try to figure out what's going on. We need to know a little history, a little context, what's happening. And I want to begin by saying there, there are four, five, I was going to say four and a half major characters in this passage that we need to know about. The first one is Vashti. Vashti in this setting in chapter 1, she is the reigning queen of Persia. Uh, she is a beautiful woman. She's a strong-willed woman, and she has principles. We'll find out later what we mean by that, uh, but she's a very important character. The second character is Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai, uh, his grandfather was uh, exiled from Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar. So he's a third generation person uh, in the Babylonian, now Persia territory. He is the cousin of Esther. Uh, Esther's father is his uncle, but he is older than Esther and he raises Esther as if she were his daughter. And he takes very good care of her. He's a very spiritual man. 
He loves his Jewish heritage and he loves God. The next character is King Xerxes. Um, uh, King Xerxes uh, is a, uh, in the setting, he's into his third year as reigning king. He's, uh, uh, the Persia has defeated uh, King Nebuchadnezzar some years ago, maybe 50, 60 years ago. They have expanded their world empire to include 127 providences. That's a lot of territory. Uh, his personality is key to understanding this. Uh, he's not a strong leader. He's kind of a lukewarm leader. He can be swayed both to the left and to the right, to the front and to the back. He tends to make rush decisions, tends to be very emotional. If you catch him on a good day, he's the greatest person. But if you catch him on a bad day or make him angry, he's the worst nightmare. And so that's the key to understanding what's going on here. And then our last character is Esther. She's the, the most beautiful woman in the land. Uh, she will soon um, become uh, the queen of Persia. Uh, she is obedient to Mordecai. She is proud of her Jewish heritage and she loves the Lord. She is one of the strongest women of all of, all of history, one of the most faithful. She puts everything on the line for her people and trusting her God. So that's the, that's the characters there. The setting is, is in Persia. Susa is the capital of Persia. That's where it's taking place. Uh, King uh, Xerxes is in his third reign, third year of his reign. Uh, they are, the setting is one of full of glory, uh, no enemies, uh, the, the, that country or nation is just growing, growing, growing. So that's what the setting is here. As we come to chapter one, uh, what is happening here is the king of Xerxes is uh, comfortable in his greatness. He's boasting in his glory. And so what he does uh, as, as looking at all that he has amassed, all that he has, he decides to throw a 180-day celebration. For 180 days, there are different events that are happening to uh, mark the greatness of the Persian nation. Now, what happens after that 180 days, that six-month period, there is a seven-day feast, a seven-day feast. And so they eat for seven days. And so uh, the Bible says here on the seventh day, uh, he summons Queen Vashti, a beautiful woman. He want, he, uh, King of Xerxes has had a little bit to drink, too much to drink. He is with his nobles. And so just like he wanted to show off his great nation and how powerful they are, he wanted to show off his beautiful queen. He wanted to have her come and dance uh, in front of him and his nobles, his officials. Uh, he wanted to show her off. But when he summons her, she knows that he's been drinking. She knows that she uh, he wants to just show off and she rebels. She doesn't come when, he, when, uh, when she is called to come by the king, which is an amazing thing at that time. Because there are consequences that have to be paid for that. He calls her again and she still refuses to come. And it causes an uproar in his kingdom because now the men uh, feel that if it gets out, that Bashti has defied the order of the king, then their wives and the women of that kingdom will begin to rebel and revolt against their husbands and other men. It's a big thing because she has disrespected the king in a way where he's backed up into a corner and can't do anything about it. He must do something. But to his nature, he has trouble making decisions. And what he does, he, le he leans on his advisors to guide him. And he usually goes with what they recommend 
you know, for better or for worse. So what is recommended here, we find here is that Vashti will be banished from the kingdom. She would no longer be king. Her position will be taken away. She can no longer approach the king. She's kept out of his kingdom and just becomes an ordinary person. So she is stripped of her title for disobeying him. And that's because the official, one of the king's officials recommended that to the king. And he said, yes, let's go ahead and do that. So we see that's happening there. It looks bad, but we got to understand in the book of Esther, the name God or the word God is never mentioned at all. You will not see G-O-D and mention it all in here, but you can see God working in the background. And what here, we see Vashti being relieved of her duties as king, seemed like a bad thing, but it's part of God's plan uh, to save the Jews in Persia, to save the Jews in Persia. So just take a foot in it. It looks bad, but God is working his plan. No one knows what's happening yet, but God is working it out. He's in control. And that's what we can learn from our lives is that sometimes things happen in our life and we don't know why, but it's really because God is working a plan to prevent something or to save us from something in the future. I have a friend named Andre, uh, I won't give his last name, but he was working for a couple of years ago for a retail establishment and he enjoyed it, loved it, had a good position. Everything's going well. And so uh, about a year and a half into that position, another job offer came. And it came out the blue. He wasn't looking for it, but he was referred to by somebody. And he talked with them, and, he, and, and everything worked out well, and he got that job. And then a month after he took that job, that company that he worked for started laying off people, and he would have been one of the ones who have been laid off. So a lot of times when things come in our, our life, whether good or bad, is God is protecting us. He is saving us from something. And a lot of us have, have uh, had that same experience. God has blessed us or God has moved us. We don't know why. We may not even like it, but we look back later and we can see what God is doing. And that's what's happening here. God's plan is to save the Jews in Persia. So what's happening here is that uh, after Vashti is no longer queen, the king of Xerxes has to find another queen. And so he sends out words to all his officials, all his people, and they're searching for the, all the beautiful women in there. And so they're supposed to bring all the beautiful women back to Persia. And then he's going to uh, put them through uh, a 12-month training process or mentoring process and then he's going to choose the queen from those beautiful ladies and so this is exactly what happens women are brought uh before the king the king says for six months you're going to learn how to dress for six months you're going to learn how to put the perfume on and the makeup and look beautiful at that time i will choose my queen and so the bible says that esther was beautiful. She was gorgeous. She stood out. And the Bible says that she, out of all the women, found favor with the king. In fact, when the king saw her for the very first time, he knew that was going to be the one that was going to be his queen. And so here we have uh, Esther the uh, uh, becomes the queen. She's the cousin of Mordecai. And so what that means is that because she is the queen, uh, Mordecai has the access or can get or can influence the kingdom through her. If he needs something or wants something, he just goes to Esther. Esther goes to the king and it's done like that. Or she uses her influence to make it happen. So that's a good thing. God has now put a Jewish person, a Jewish woman, a strong woman in the position uh, next to the king. And he's going to use that position to save the Jews in Persia. Now look what God does here. Uh, Mordecai, a Jew, uh, really a nobody. They don't, Mordecai has given uh, Esther complete instruction not to tell anybody that she's a Jew, 
not to tell anybody she's associated with her people, not to tell anybody that she's related to him. He protects her. But Mordecai one time is sitting out by the king's gate. And so he hears uh, two eunuchs that are upset with the king, maybe because he's showing he has a, too much favoritism uh, to a one particular type of people, or maybe they just don't like what the king is doing, and they plot to do harm to the king. Mordecai hears that. Then he tells Esther, Esther tells the king that a man named Mordecai overheard this, that two eunuchs was trying to kill him. A trial is held and an investigation is taking place. Those two eunuchs are found guilty and they are hung. And so the king uh, understands who did that, Mordecai, but he quickly forgets his name. He has a lot of things on his, on his mind. He has to remember too much, but he doesn't, uh, really doesn't do anything for Mordecai, but he's very grateful at what happens. And so, um, but what did happen is that that uh, situation where Mordecai saved him is recorded in the book of Chronicles in the presence of, of the king. So it is written down as a part of history. Now, uh, this, is, this is when Hanan comes into play. He's a, a Gittite, A-G-A-G-I-T-E. And what that means is the significance of that is the Agites, I just say Agites, they despise Jews. They have a long running history with Jews that dates back to King Saul and Samuel. If you remember the story is that uh, Samuel had told Saul to, to destroy all the people of Agag, destroy them all, every sheep, every oxen, every horse, every child, every woman, and every man. And then Saul disobeyed because when Samuel comes up, he hears the, the, the cattle, he hears the oxen, he sees the king standing there. And so Samuel is upset. So he takes the sword and he kills the king. So there's a, 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 a hatred between the Jews and the Agites. Just a hatred. Okay. So here in this lesson here, Hanan is promoted to second in command by King Xerxes. Second in command, he advanced over all other officials. He is number two in the command. In fact, he has a signet ring of the king himself. And whatever that signet ring he puts on is as if the king gave that order. But And so Hanai, he's proud in this position. He's boastful in this position. He despises the Jews. And so one time he's entering out the kingdom, out the gate of the kingdom, of the king's palace. And all the people bow down to him except Mordecai. And that infuriates him. And it infuriates him because he was a Jew. It infuriates him because he despised the Jews. And so from then on, that one point, he didn't do anything to Mordecai then, but he plotted to take the, all, not only Mordecai, but all of the Jewish people out throughout the king. Of kingdom of King of Xerxes. And so what he does, he devises a plan. He says he's going to cast lots to see what day he's going to destroy all the Jews in all the provinces. And so what he does is that he creates a pamphlet to put people on notice that a day is coming forth in which he will destroy all the people. And so before he does that, he meets with the king. He tells the king that some, there's a group of people who are disrespecting you. They're not going by your bylaws. Um, they are, they don't, they don't obey. They're unruly people. Can I have permission to kill these people? If you allow me to have permission to kill these people, I will put $10,000 of my own money into your treasury. And so the king is outraged. He's being manipulated, but he's being outraged because uh, somebody's not going along with the program. And of course, he wants those people taken care of. So he gives uh, Hannah three, Hannah 
free authority to carry out this plan. He says, the money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. He trusted him, but he's being manipulated. Hanan hates the Jews, despises Mordecai. His hatred for them is causing him to want to kill them all, causing him to manipulate the king. That's going to come back and hurt him. So right now, it seems as though Hanan is going to have his way. It seems as though. But God is putting people in place to save the people, the Jewish people in Persia. And so going back to what I said earlier, he, made, he does a written decree that's passed out to all the provinces. The courage to pass him out. He has the stamp of the king that one day in the new, near future, I'm going to announce that decree. And on that day, all the Jews in all the provinces will be massacred, destroyed. Not one will exist. The Bible says in chapter four, Mordecai learns about all that had been done. He rips his clothes in mourning. He puts on sackcloth and ashes and shouts in the middle of the city, stands by the gate into the king's palace, can't go in. So uh, Esther hears about it. She sends a unit to go. She can't go herself, but she sends a unit to go and ask Mordecai, what is the problem? What's going on? Why are you doing this? Mordecai comes back and tells him that, that, that what is going on, that Hannah is plotting and planning to kill all the Jews. He gave a written decree to this unit to give back to Esther to explain to her and for her to show to the king what is about to take place. And so Mordecai tells Esther that she must do something, that she must stop what's going on. And so uh, Esther responds back that if I go before the king and I'm not invited, I can be put to death. She says, I've only been in this position for 30 days. You're asking me to risk my life that I, this position that I have, this luxury that I live in, risk my life before the king. And when I'm just so new here, I've been here 30 days and he can kill me on the spot. But there's one thing is that if he doesn't kill me, he gives me a scepter, to a gold scepter. He reaches out to me and that means that he's going to spare my life. But you are asking me to risk my life when I haven't been called to the king in 30 days, when I've been in this position just a short time. So Esther is kind of caught off guard. She's upset because you're asking me to give up everything, even my own life. And so that was told to Mordecai. Mordecai does this. Look what he said. He puts a, a conviction on her that's out of this world, tells her the hard, cold truth. Do not... Think of yourself that in the king's palace, you will escape any more than all other Jews. Meaning that if you think that the Jews die, don't think you're going to escape. Uh, he says, for you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. Meaning that God will bring somebody up to do what you're supposed to do to bring them salvation. But you and your father's house will perish. In other words, you will die. Your father's name will be cursed. And then this is the key word, the most famous passage in this book, and most famous passage in almost in all of scripture. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Look at the prophetic words. You're look, thinking about yourself a little bit, Esther, but do you, don't you think God is the one that has put you up there at, at, as queen of Persia for a time like this to bring salvation to the Jews in Persia? Don't think you got here by yourself or you did something to get this or your good looks got you here. No, God has put you here to do his work for such a time as this. And we got to remember this also. A lot of us, we're in, our, in a position and we think that we got there on our own. 
We want to brag. We want to be in glory. We don't want to lose it. And we don't want to help anybody. We don't want to take what God has blessed us with to help somebody else. And what we got to understand is that could it be that God has brought you in this position for such a time as this to help the, the poor, to feed the hungry, to clothe the, 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 the clothless, to give shelter to the shelterless, to bring words of encouragement, to share the gospel to the lost, to lend a helping hand to somebody else. God, if you're living and breathing, God has brought us to a, a position that we are in life to help somebody else. And that's what Mordecai is trying to instill upon Esther. And it works. And the question is, what do godly people do when they find themselves in a tough situation? When spiritual warfare is all around them, Satan is trying to take the Jews out, God's chosen people. He is uh, manipulating Hannah. He's taking that anger and hatred that he has for the Jews, and Satan is using it for his advantage. He's, uh, Satan is trying to manipulate a, a weak king. He's trying to intimidate Esther, trying to scare her. But God is in control. God is taking what Satan is trying to do, and God is going to use it for the salvation of the Jews. And so the, this is what godly people do. Esther said, gather all the Jews found in Susa. They're going to hold a fast, a three-day fast, where they don't eat or drink. And her women in her court, they will fast too. She will fast. And she said, then I will go against the, go to the king, even though it's against the law, even though I can get killed. If I perish, I perish. And Mordecai then went away and did everything that Esther had ordered him to do. That's what, pe that's what godly people do. They stay and they trust God even though the situation looks dim, even though the situation looks hopeless, even though their life is on the line. If I perish, I perish. That's what godly people, they don't retaliate. They keep their eyes open, their ears sharpened, and listen and obey the word of God. So here we have chapter five, um, on the third day of this fast, Esther puts her royal robes on. She enters into the court of the king's palace. And guess what? The king invites her in, gives her that gold scepter, spares her life, and doesn't put her to death. God is using that king, changing that king's heart. So he has favor with Esther. He's thwarting the plans of Satan himself. And so the king invites her in and says, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you, even if it's the half of the kingdom. And so Esther says, I, I want to invite you to a feast that I have prepared for today. And I want you to bring Hannon with you. I want him to come. Why invite Hannon? Because she's setting him up so he will not even see what is about to come. Why is she inviting the king? Because she wants to win, continue to have favor with the king. She wants the king to be around her so the king will always will like her and will show favor on her and see what kind of person she really is. And so they came to the feast, and they was drinking. After they were drinking the wine, and then the king asked her again, "What is your wish? It shall be granted you. What is your request? Even half the kingdom, it shall be fulfilled." Then she said, "My wish and my request is, if I found favor in your sight of the king, if it pleases the king, grant my wish and fulfill my request. Let the king and Hanan, Hanan, come to the king feast." and I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king said. So she invites the king and Hammond another feast, another time of fellowship. Hammond has, no, has no idea what's going on. 
The king is likes the attention that he's getting. He is enjoying the feast. He he, he doesn't understand what's going on. Esther thinks highly of the king, but she wants the king to know who she is, who she wants to make sure. She's just trying to soften him up a little bit so when the point time comes, the king will see her for who she really is and believe what she has to say. So after that day of feast, that second day, uh, the, after the first, I mean, excuse me, after the first uh, feast, Hannah is all happy. He's glad uh, that the queen is inviting me to another feast. Uh, she likes me, uh, but he comes out of the king's gate and he, he sees Mordecai. And the Bible says he neither rose or trembled before him. And then that filled even greater wrath with Mordecai. Mordecai goes back, tells his wife, tells his friends, talks about how good he has it, but talks about what makes, what kills all the blessings that I have is that this one man will not bow down to me. This one man brings wrath to me. And all that I have is nothing to me. As long as I see Mordecai sitting at the king's gate, not bound to me. So his wife says, why don't you bring, build a gallow 50 cubits feet high and hang this man on it. And then go to the feast, joyfully to the king with the feast on tomorrow. And so Haman had that gallow made. And then uh, the night, on that same night, the night before this feast, the king, Bible says the king could not sleep. He gave orders to bring the book of memorial, memorial deeds, the chronicles. And as he's reading those memorial, memorable deeds, he reads the deed about Mordecai saving his life. And then he comes to the conclusion and says, has this man been honored? Has he been recognized? What have we done for him? What should we have done for him? Has he come to my court? Has he, what, what have we done? He said we should bring royal robes on him. We should uh, have him paraded in the through the city as as a man of honor. We should uh, spare no, put a crown on his head. We should do these things. So the Bible says, as Morda, as uh, Haman comes into the king's court, uh, the king asks him, "What should I do for a man that delights in me?" And so the king says, "This, this, and that." And then, but Hammond, Hammond thinks it's him, but he says, no, it's Mordecai. I want you to dress him up in royal robes, crown his head, have the horses drawn, and parade him as a man of honor throughout the capital city. Mordecai is tore up from the floor. He is distressed. He is upset because he was going to ask the king to have permission to kill this man, Mordecai, who would not bow down to him. And when he gets there, God has done something different. God has thwarted his plan. Without Mordecai doing anything, without Esther doing anything, God has thwarted his plan based on what he did on in chapter two. And so Mordecai goes back, tells his wife, tells his brother, and they say, you ought to leave this man alone. Can't you see he's protected? Leave this guy alone. You will not prevail, prevail against him. He will be your downfall. You will fall before him. But Hammond is upset. And so that banquet is a feast is about to happen. That banquet. The units hurry and go get Hammond. They bring him to the feast that Esther has prepared. This brings us to chapter seven. It says, So the king and Hammond went in feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king asked to Esther, asked Esther again, what is your wish? It shall be granted to you. What is your request? Even half my kingdom. What is your wish? What is your request? Esther answers this time, if I found favor in your sight, O king, if it pleases the king, let my life be granted me for my wish. My wish is that my life be spared. And so the king wondered, what is going on? What do you mean your life be spared? And he said, and my people for my request. What people are you talking about? You want your 
people to be saved to? What is happening? He doesn't know what's going on. He says, she says, for we have been sold or betrayed, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we have been solely merely, if we have been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affection of affliction is not to be compared with the loss of the king. She says, this is a plan to kill me and to kill my people. If this wasn't such a big thing, this was like slavery, I wouldn't have come to you. But if, if our people are killed and destroyed, it is a loss to you. Something is gonna be taken away from you, valuable. I will not be your king. You will not have these people as your, as your people, as your labor. Uh, it will cost you something. It will, and she's saying that it will cost you more than the ten thousand uh, dollars that you gave Mordecai to carry out his mission. And so here we have here. Uh, then King Xerxes said to Queen Esther, "Who is he, and where is he? Who has dared to do this?" King is upset. He doesn't have a clue. Esther said, "A foe and an enemy. This wicked Haman." She set him up. She brought Haman to the king's table and set him up. She wined and dined him and set him up. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. She was he was terrified because he did not know that Esther was a Jew. He was terrified because he did not know Esther knew that the plan he was about to carry out and why he was going to carry it out. And so now he's terrified because now there's a there's a dichotomy. Who is the king going to believe? Queen Esther or him in second in command? And Queen Esther has been whining and dining him, and she's more believable than he is. And he knows that he is in trouble now, life or death. He is terrified. And the king arose in his wrath. He is so upset, stops drinking, goes out to the garden, catches his breath, catches his thoughts, comes back, sees um, uh, what it looks like Hammond of molesting or touching inappropriately. Queen Esther, uh, when he's begging for his life, that's what he's really doing, but it looks inappropriate to the king. He, uh, he, uh, and then he says, uh, the king returned to the place of the garden where they were drinking wine. Hammond was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence in his own house? The king is mixed up, crazy, angry, mad. He can't think straight. He can't see straight. And the word left the mouth of the king that covered Haman's face. They covered his face. They escorted him out. They one of the eunuchs in attendance. Look what he says. Moreover, the gallows that Haman had prepared for Mordecai who saved the king, that little unit gets involved and puts a thought into a King Xerxes' mind, says, use the gallows that Haman was going to use for Mordecai, use it on him himself, and that's what King Xerxes does. He says, hang him on that, so they hang Haman on the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai, then the wrath of the king abated. Wow. That's a lot. What do we learn from here? God is in control. We don't have to take matters into our own selves. When things don't look like they're going well, we got a God working behind the scene, fixing everything, putting everything in place. When it looks like we're about to be had, comes to our rescue, pulls a switch, and then we're delivered. We're saved from our situation. What does God want us to do? He wants us to trust him. When we go through spiritual warfare and there's an attack against us, trust him completely. You see, what happened was here is that when Esther was faced with a tough decision, when Mordecai, they were tough with a faith decision, they fasted and they prayed. That means they prayed to God. That means they trusted him. They, they said, God, I give it to you. I'm in your hands. I will obey you. I will not get involved. I will allow you to do your thing. I won't try to mess it up. And all I'm just trying to say today, you may find yourself in a difficult spot. Your boss may be on you too hard. Life may be on you too hard. 
your friend, your so-called friend may be uh, getting you too hard, assembly may get you too hard, somebody is oppressing you. Don't retaliate in the flesh. Go to God in prayer. Fast. Give the situation to him and see how God works out that situation perfectly. God is in control. God is sovereign. Although God is invisible, he's spirit. God is working. And if you're a child of God, God is going to make sure that the evil one does not prevail against you. But all we have to do is keep our eyes open, our ears sharpened, trust and obey God, and watch God do the impossible. Watch God do what he does best, that is save and rescue his people from time and time again. And you will look back and you will glory in God's name. You will look back and say nothing but God. You will look back and you'll share it with somebody else. You'll say that uh, it was God. It was God. In fact, the Jewish people have a feast called P-U-R-I-M, Purim. And they celebrate it to this day how God saved the people of Israel or Mordecai from the gallows of Haman. You will have that memory, how God saved you etched in your mind. And that memory will be told to this generation and to this generation of how God saved you from that situation. May God bless you. I hope this lesson has been a blessing to you. I will see you next week. Remember, God's in control.